Once a blithe young lad of twenty, Sean Kelvin set off to the States in pursuit of his fortune. After fifteen years, he returned to his native Kerry, a changed man. His youthful cheer had faded, and he appeared weathered by life's experiences. Whether he had found his fortune or not remained a mystery, as Sean was a reserved man who seldom spoke about his accomplishments. Sean Kelvin was of modest stature, with sturdy shoulders and deep-set blue eyes beneath dark brows, matching his dark hair. One of his shoulders habitually hunched slightly higher than the other, a relic of his time spent shielding his eyes from the intense glare of an open hearth furnace in Pittsburgh. Others claimed it was a remnant of his days as a sparring partner at a boxing camp, protecting his chin. Upon returning home, Sean discovered he was the last of the Kelvin family, and their ancestral farm had been absorbed by Big Liam O'Grady's ranch in Moivala. Despite O'Grady obtaining the land unfairly, Sean chose not to reclaim it. Tired of conflict, he sought peace instead. Quietly reconnecting with old friends and exploring his options, he eventually acquired a small, idyllic farm on the gentle slopes of Nakanor Hill, blessed with ample sunlight and an unparalleled view of Ireland's lush landscapes, mountains, and the vast Atlantic Sea. In this lime-washed, thatched cottage with four rooms, Sean settled into a peaceful life. Despite well-meaning suggestions from friends, he showed no interest in finding a wife to share his home. Nevertheless, Faith had other plans in store for him. To assist with household tasks, Sean had an ex-Navy pensioner, skilled in managing the house and the animals. He proved to be a satisfactory helper, leaving Sean to enjoy a life that was free from excessive toil. Sean had experienced the toll of drudgery on one's soul and had no desire to become a laborious worker. He tilled the land and sowed seeds with moderation. Often, at the end of a furrow, he would rest against his cultivator, gazing out at the vast expanse of the sea beyond Shannon Mouth. On occasion, during evening hours under the majestic sky, he would spot the faint smoke of an American liner, evoking a mix of pity and relief, knowing he had left such pursuits behind. Market days led him seven miles to List Old Town, where he engaged in bartering. But it was during the long, enchanting evenings, as the summer twilight embraced his cottage, that his true friends climbed the winding lane to visit. These were the comrades he cherished, battle-hardened men who had fought in the Sixteen Rebellion, such as Matt Tobin the Thresher, the schoolmaster, and the young curate. Gathered around a stone jar of malt whiskey, they engaged in warm, friendly debates. Sometimes, his friends would gently inquire, Sean, old son, don't you feel terribly lonely? In response, Sean would derisively retort, like hell I am. Why should I, nothing but the daylight, wind, and sun setting like the wrath of God, they'd remark, that's precisely it. So what, but after the thrilling times you had in the States dash? Yes. Tell me, my fine friends, 
Have you ever witnessed a furnace in full blast, a remarkable sight, indeed, indeed it is. But if I could transport you to a steel foundry this very moment, you would believe that God had faithfully judged you to the very hearth of hell, this humorous banter would be followed by laughter and another drink from the stone jar, on Sundays, Sean would attend the grey chapel, three miles away, perched above the dark cliffs of Dune Bay. Little did he know that fate had something extraordinary in store for him at the chapel, waiting to unfold its mysterious plan. Sitting serenely on a worn wooden bench or occasionally kneeling on the dusty footboard, Sean would fix his unwavering deep-set eyes on the vestment celebrant, engaging in his prayers with deliberate slowness. Sometimes, he would enter a peculiar trance, transcending dreams and visions, connecting with the unfathomable depths of his soul. However, as time passed, Sean's gaze shifted from the celebrant to the two seats ahead, where a young woman sat every Sunday. Week after week, his initial casual admiration for her blossomed into something warmer and more profound. The girl possessed a graceful white nape, adorned with short red hair that Sean found captivating. He admired the color and waviness of her fiery locks, as well as the way her shoulders and neck leaned slightly forward when she prayed or dreamt. After the service concluded, Sean would linger in his seat just to catch a fleeting yet certain glimpse of her face as she walked past. He found her countenance equally enchanting, the wide-set gray eyes, gently curved cheekbones, and clean-molded lips exuding both austerity and sensitivity. Ironically, the girl's name was Ellen O'Grady, and Sean couldn't help but feel a pulse of excitement, despite her association with the O'Grady family, who had taken possession of his ancestral land. Only one person in the crowded chapel noticed Sean's gaze and the emotions behind it, Ellen's brother, Big Liam O'Grady. He was the very man who had effectively stolen the Kelvin Acres. With a contemptuous smile characteristic of his nature, he stored this knowledge away for potential use in the future. Ellen O'Grady had reached a stage beyond her youth, entering a mature phase that seemed to have no definitive end. Though she might have been around thirty years old, her poise and the sturdy foundation of her bones preserved her from the fading of mere prettiness. Despite being sought after in marriage, Ellen had not accepted anyone's proposal, mainly due to her brother's interference. Big Liam O'Grady was a burly, sandy-haired man with the strength of an ox and a heart no larger than a sour apple. Prone to violent outbursts, he was a churchgoer by habit, but his true devotion lay in the pursuit of wealth. Living on the expansive ranch farm of Moivala, Ellen served as his housekeeper and general laborer, excelling in these roles. She had refused marriage proposals because her brother prohibited her from entertaining any romantic interests. Marriage had never been a priority for Big Liam either, as he found few spinsters with dowries enticing enough to catch his eye. Those few who did possess considerable wealth had developed tastes and habits he deemed undesirable, such as expensive education, jazz music, smoking, 
or an obsession with motorcars. Nevertheless, when the opportunity presented itself in the form of a widow named Kathy Carey, who inherited a substantial farm, Big Liam wasted no time. He sent an emissary to negotiate a union, but Kathy refused to consider marriage until Ellen had a place of her own. Recalling Sean Kelvin's infatuation with his sister, Big Liam's sneering memory resurfaced. How could someone like Sean dare to cast longing glances at an O'Grady? A man who had meekly accepted the loss of his ancestral land and chose to live in seclusion on Nakanor Hill. Nevertheless, Big Liam saw an opportunity. The required dowry for Ellen's marriage would be conveniently small, and she would never want for anything under his care. He considered himself a descendant of esteemed chieftains, making him a fitting match. On the next market day in Listol, Big Liam sought out Sean Kelvin and clamped a massive, sandy-haired hand on his hunched shoulder. Sean Kelvin, let's have a word. Come and have a drink, hesitating momentarily, Sean eventually replied, very well. Although he didn't hold Big Liam in high regard, he saw no reason to hurt anyone's feelings. They headed to Sullivan's bar and shared a drink, with Sean generously footing the bill. Big Liam wasted no time and, in a somewhat condescending manner, broached the topic he had in mind. I want to see Ellen settled in a place of her own, he stated. Sean's heart leaped into his throat, but he maintained his stoic expression. The words were trapped within him, unable to escape from the tight grip of his emotions. Your place is modest, the burly man continued, but I hear there's no debt burdening it. Nakanor never saw much of a dowry, and I can't offer much for Ellen. Let's say two hundred pounds at harvest's end if prices improve. What do you say, Sean Kelvin, swallowing the lump in his throat, Sean responded calmly, what does Ellen think, I haven't asked her, replied Big Liam, but what would she say, damn it. Whatever she says, it's for her to say, not you, Big Liam, yet, what could Ellen say? As she peered into her heart, she found emptiness, realizing that her fate was tied to her brother's domineering nature. She looked up at Nakanor Hill, imagining the cozy white cottage amid green fields and heather. There, she envisioned sunny days and pleasant breezes. Lastly, she glanced at Sean Kelvin, a solid, gentle man with captivating eyes. As she prayed, she resigned herself to a fate more pitiful than tears and prouder than chieftain's pride. Romance seemed far away. Though Sean wished for a more passionate response, he knew it wasn't the right moment to pursue it. Understanding the narrowness of Big Liam's soul and the purity within Ellen, he realized that she was destined for a purchased, mundane life at her brother's hearth. If that was to be, he preferred it to be his hearth. In any case, there were far worse hearths, and he trusted in God's benevolence. In the end, Ellen O'Grady became Sean Kelvin's wife. Such a simple statement, yet it held the potential for tragedy, happiness, 
or mere endurance, an array of choices as vast as the world itself. Big Liam O'Grady, despite his prompt intentions, failed to win Kathy Carey's hand in marriage. She foolishly chose to marry her own cattleman, a cheerful night wanderer who brought both challenges and moments of joy to her life. For the first time, Big Liam felt the sharp edge of his neighbor's wits, adding an unreasoning animosity towards Sean Kelvin to his pre-existing contempt. Under his own roof, Sean now had his precious, red-haired woman. He held no illusions about her feelings for him. The task of molding her into a wife and lover fell solely on his shoulders. It had to be done subtly, away from prying eyes, with gentleness and consideration beyond comprehension. He hardly recognized himself as he undertook this transformative journey. Sean first tended to material matters, hiring a young servant maid to assist Ellen with household chores. He also acquired a rubber-tired cart and a half-bred gelding, perfect for their trips to Listol on market days. The couple would sell and buy goods, enjoying smooth journeys with groceries in the cart's well and a bundle of second-hand American magazines on Ellen's side. In the nights, as the winds from the Atlantic plains howled above the chimney, they would sit together by the blazing peat fire. Sean would read aloud from the vibrant, colorful magazines, often recounting unbelievable stories. Ellen would sit and listen, her smile radiant as she knitted or sewed small items. Sean sensed that, despite her quiet demeanor, she was probing and exploring, delving into the texture of his soul, as he shared his life's marvels with her. He vividly described the glow of molten metal, the searing heat, and the resounding clang, making her feel the intensity of his experiences. Ellen could envision the rope square under the dazzling light of the hooded arcs, with the curling smoke above. She understood the explosive passion of the game and thrilled when Sean taught her how to position her wrist for the final, devastating right hook. Sometimes, the stories would bring laughter, and Ellen would chuckle or laugh heartily, her red curls bouncing with mirth. To make her laugh was a truly gratifying experience. You see, Ellen, he said uncomfortably, the times are tough for the big ranchers, and we don't really need the money anyway, do you think Big Liam does? Her voice carried a sharp edge. He could buy you and all of Nakanor and still have plenty left. Will you ask him again, but, my dear, I never wanted a dowry from you. She appreciated his sentiment, but she wanted to earn respect and admiration for him. She knew that Sean might become the subject of ridicule among his peers if he continued to back down. You silly boy. Big Liam will never understand your feelings when money is involved. She smiled causing a pang in Sean's heart. He couldn't be sure if the smile held contempt for himself or her brother. Sean asked Big Liam once more, feeling uneasy about it but understanding his wife's intention. And then, he asked him a third time. The matter had become quite famous by now, 
a topic of discussion among both men and women. People started placing bets on whether Big Liam would finally give in or lose his temper and harm Sean, as he had done to others in his rages. It was a shame that this situation had escalated so much. Curiously, the prudent advisors who suggested involving lawyers were not among Sean's close friends. However, his loyal friends, including Matt Tobin, were always there, supporting him. Finally, the day came when Big Liam grew fed up with being asked. It happened during the Big October Cattle Fair in Listol. Big Liam had just sold 20 fat, pulled Angus beeves at a good price but hadn't made a bank deposit yet, so he had a large roll of bills in his inner vest pocket. To make matters worse, he had consumed more whiskey than was wise. He decided it was time to put an end to this incessant pestering by Sean and humiliate him in front of everyone. Big Liam approached Sean and Ellen, barging into their conversation with Matt Tobin. His grip on Sean's shoulder was fierce, but Sean managed to free himself without any visible effort. Although Matt Tobin noticed this display of strength, Sean remained composed, gazing steadily at Big Liam, mockingly, Big Liam demanded, what is it, little fellow? Don't be ashamed to ask. Sean didn't respond with words or actions. He maintained eye contact with the imposing man. Big Liam continued to taunt him, showing his teeth in a grin. Go on, you whelp. What do you want, you know? Oh Grady, I do. Listen, Shaneen. Big Liam's hand struck Sean's shoulder again. Listen, Shaneen. If I had a dowry to give my sister, it wouldn't be to a shrimp like you. Go to hell. With that, he flung Sean backward as if he were tossing a mere straw figure. Sean stumbled backward but quickly regained his balance, coiling like a spring, ready to confront Big Liam. However, just as quickly, he relaxed, turning away from the confrontation and facing his wife, Ellen. Her face was tense and determined, her eyes gleaming with a fierce spirit. Ellen, my love, he said in his deep voice, why should we embarrass ourselves like this, embarrassment, she cried out. Will you let him shame you like this, but he's your own brother, Ellen, in front of everyone, and he's cheating you, my goodness, he lamented, what does his dirty money matter to me? Are you truly an O'Grady, after all? That stung her, and she retaliated in one final effort. Ellen placed a hand below her breast, looking close into Sean's face. Her voice was low and bitter, heard only by him, I am an O'Grady. It is a great pity that the father of this my son is a Kelvin and a coward. Sean's cheekbones were like hard marble, but his voice remained soft as a dove's. Is that the way of it? Let us be going home then, in the name of God. He reached for her arm, but she shook his hand off determined to walk at his side, head held high, through the people who made way for them.
Her brother mocked them with a loud, mocking laugh as he strode off through the fair. There was plenty of talk afterward. Sean had a narrow squeak that time. Did you see the way he flung him? I wager he'll give Big Liam a wide berth after this. And he's supposed to be a boxer. That's a pound you owe me, Matt Tobin. Matt Tobin replied, I'll pay it but there was dismay and gloom on his face. His friend had failed him in the face of the people. Sean and Ellen rode home in silence in their tub cart. The heart-sickening silence continued that evening at the table and by the fireside. Throughout the night, they lay side by side, still and mute, their hearts heavy with the unspoken subject that possessed them. Ellen's heart was desolate as she lay on her side, staring into the darkness, grieving for what she had said and unable to unsay it. Sean, on his back, contemplated things with cold clarity. He realized he was at a fork in life, and a finger pointed unmistakably. He must risk shattering all happiness, he must do something so final and decisive that it would never be questioned again. Before morning, he came to his bitter decision, cursing himself for not realizing sooner that he should never have taken an O'Grady without breaking the O'Grady's. At his usual hour, Sean got up early in the morning and went about his chores as usual. He tended to the cattle, rubbed down the half-bread, and helped the servant maid with the milk in the creaming pans. After finishing his unhungrily eaten breakfast, he harnessed his gelding and hitched it to the tub cart. He returned to the kitchen, broke the silence, and asked Ellen, will you come with me down to see your brother? Ellen hesitated, her hands thrown wide in a helpless, hopeless gesture. It's of little use going to see my brother, Sean. It's me who should go, and perhaps not come back, don't blame me now or later, Ellen. It has been put on me, and the thing I am going to do is the only thing to be done. Will you come? Sean asked resolutely, very well, Ellen agreed tonelessly. I will be ready in a minute. And so, they set out together, traveling the four miles down to the big farmhouse of Mavala. As they arrived at the cobbled yard, it was empty. The long, low, limewashed dwelling house stood on one side of the square, while the two-storied line of steadings, with a wide arch in the middle, stood on the other side. The purr and zoom of a threshing machine could be heard coming through the arch. Sean tied the half-bread to the wheel of a farm cart and, with Ellen by his side, approached the house. A slattern servant girl leaned over the kitchen half-door and pointed through the arch, saying that the master was out beyond in the haggard. She offered to run across for him, no need for that, Acra, Sean replied. I'll get him. Ellen, will you wait here? No, Ellen said firmly. I'll come with you. She knew her brother well. As they walked through the arch, the purr and zoom of the threshing machine grew louder. They turned the corner and walked into the midst of activity. 
A long double row of comb-pointed corn stacks stretched across the yard, and Matt Tobin's portable threshing machine was busy. Men on the platform were feeding the flying drum with loosened sheaves, their hands moving in a rhythmic sway. As the toothed drum bit at the corn sheaves, it made an angry snarl that transformed into a satisfied zoom. The wide conveying belt carried the golden straw up a steep incline to where other men were building a long rick, and others were attending to the corn shoots, carrying sacks to the granary. Matt Tobin himself tended to the engine, feeding the firebox with hard black peat sods. Around two dozen men were working, as was the custom, with friends and neighbors lending a hand with the threshing. Sean spotted his brother-in-law, Big Liam, bent over the engine, focused on his work. As Sean got closer, he could feel the tension in the air. He cleared his throat and called out, Liam, Big Liam straightened up and turned to face Sean, a mix of surprise and annoyance on his face. What is it now, Kelvin, he grumbled, Sean's jaw tightened, but he stood tall, his face determined. I've come to ask you once more, Liam, about Ellen's dowry, he said firmly, Big Liam scoffed and laughed scornfully. Dowry? What dowry? I told you before, I have no money to spare for that. Go on, get out of here, you little runt. Sean's heart pounded, but he didn't back down. Listen, Liam, he said, his voice steady, I don't want your money. I never married Ellen for her dowry. All I want is to be treated with respect, respect. Big Liam laughed again, louder this time. Respect from you. You're nothing but a weakling, a coward. You think I'd respect a man like you, the crowd of workers, drawn by the commotion, watched the scene unfold. Ellen stood silently by Sean's side, her face grave. Sean felt a surge of anger, but he fought to control it. It's not about respect for me, he said, his voice unwavering. It's about treating Ellen, your own sister, with the love and consideration she deserves, Big Liam's face darkened, and he took a step closer to Sean, his voice menacing. You dare talk to me about love and consideration? You're a fool if you think I'll ever give you what you want. For a moment, the air was tense, and the crowd held its breath. Then, without another word, Sean turned and walked away. Ellen followed him silently, her heart heavy with the weight of the situation, as they drove back to Nakanor, a somber silence hung between them. Sean's mind was made up. He knew what he had to do, when they arrived home, he turned to Ellen. I'm going to make things right, he said resolutely. I won't let Big Liam belittle you or me anymore. I'll find a way to provide for us without his money. We'll make our own way. Ellen looked into Sean's steadfast eyes, seeing the determination and love that burned within him. She placed a hand on his cheek, her heart swelling with love and admiration for her husband. Yes, she said softly, let's make our own way, Sean. 
I believe in you, and together, we'll face whatever comes our way. From that day forward, Sean Kelvin and Ellen O'Grady embarked on a journey of resilience and determination. They faced hardships and challenges, but their love and devotion to each other never wavered. In time, they built a life of their own, finding happiness and contentment in each other's company. And as the years passed, the tale of Sean Kelvin and Ellen O'Grady became a legend in their community. They were admired and respected for their strength and love, and their union became a symbol of true devotion and perseverance. The people of Nakanor would forever remember the day when love triumphed over pride, and the Kelvin and O'Grady families were united not by money or status but by the enduring bond of love. Big Liam rounded the engine, his temper flaring as he saw Sean and Ellen approaching. In his shirt sleeves, with sandy hair covering his great forearms, he was still affected by the stale whiskey from the previous day. His disposition was sour, and he seemed ready to snap at anyone who crossed his path. Two slow strides brought him face to face with Sean and Ellen, his feet apart and his head aggressively forward. What is it this time? He barked at them, offering an un-Irish welcome to his sister and her husband. Undeterred, Sean and Ellen continued to advance steadily. Meanwhile, Matt Tobin, the engine's owner, deliberately throttled down his machine. Big Liam, furious at the change in pitch, shot an angry look over his shoulder. What the hell do you mean, Tobin? Get on with the work, he commanded. To hell with yourself, Big Liam. This is my engine, and if you don't like it, you can leave it. Matt Tobin retorted, shutting the throttle, and the purring of the flywheel gradually subsided. We will see about that in a minute, Big Liam threatened, turning his attention back to Sean and Ellen. What is it? He growled impatiently. I need to speak with you privately. It won't take long, Sean replied calmly and coldly. You will not, on a busy morning, sneered the big man. There is no need for private words between me and Sean Kelvin, there is a need, Sean insisted. It will be best for all of us if you hear what I have to say in your own house, or here on my own land. Out with it. I don't care who hears. Big Liam declared. Sean surveyed his surroundings. Men on the thresher and the straw rick leaned on their fork handles, observing the unfolding scene. Other men moved in from different parts of the stockyard, pretending to check on what caused the stoppage but their true interest lay in the confrontation between the two brothers-in-law. He found himself surrounded by Clan O'Grady, mostly big, strong, blonde men, exuding confidence and pride in their lineage. Among them, Matt Tobin was his only friend. Though some of the others weren't openly hostile, Contempt or pity lurked in their eyes. Very well, if he had to prove himself, he would do it amidst the O'Grady men. Sean turned his unwavering gaze back to Big Liam. O'Grady, he said, no longer hiding his contempt, you value money greatly, 
no harm in that. You do it yourself, Shanine, Big Liam retorted, let it be so. I will play that game with you until hell freezes over. You would bargain your sister and cheat, I will sell my soul. Listen, you big brute. You owe me two hundred pounds. Will you pay? An iron-like quality in Sean's voice made it somewhat awe-inspiring. Big Liam, about to charge forward with aggression, held back, attempting to appear playful. I will pay it when I am ready, Big Liam replied defiantly. Today, Sean insisted, no, nor tomorrow, Big Liam responded stubbornly. Very well. If you break your bargain, I break mine. What's that? shouted Big Liam, clearly taken aback. If you keep your two hundred pounds, you keep your sister, Sean declared firmly. What is it? Big Liam shouted once more, his voice breaking in astonishment. What is this you're saying, you heard me? Here is your sister Ellen. Keep her. Sean replied firmly, fires oh, hell. Big Liam was completely taken aback, his truculence replaced by sheer surprise. You can't do that, it is done, Sean asserted. Ellen had stood quietly by Sean's side like a statue, but now, as slow as doom, she faced her brother. She leaned forward, gazing into his eyes, and saw the pain hidden beneath his strong exterior. To the mother of your son, Sean Kelvin, she whispered gently to him, his voice came out cold and unyielding, in the face of God. Let him judge me, I know, I know. Ellen responded softly, then walked over to where Matt Tobin stood by the engine. Matt Tobin placed a reassuring hand on her arm. Give him time, Colleen, he whispered urgently. Give him his own time. He may be slow, but he's as deadly as an ogre when he moves. Big Liam was no fool, he knew how far he could push. There was no use in crushing Sean at this moment. The little man possessed a force that resisted being bullied. Besides, the public opinion would not be in his favor if he acted violently against Sean. The ridicule and scandal on his name would spread far beyond Aaron's borders. He needed to change his approach before it was too late. These thoughts raced through his mind as he thudded the ground three times with his iron-shod heel. Then he threw his head back and let out a bellowing laugh. You fool! I was only making fun of you. What are your measly few pounds to someone like me? Stay where you are. He turned and stormed away, vanishing through the arch. Sean Kelvin stood alone in the wide circle of men. The hands that were on the thresher and the straw rick had come down to observe the situation more closely. Now, they moved back and exchanged glances, raising eyebrows, looking at Sean, frowning, and shaking their heads. 
They knew Big Liam's temper and how his fury would be unleashed if he gave up the money. Most of them waited, ready to intervene before things escalated too far. Sean didn't look at anyone, he remained still like a rock, hands deep in his pockets, one shoulder slightly hunched, his face remarkably composed. He seemed to be the least disturbed man present. Matt Tobin held Ellen's arm to steady her and whispered in her ear, God is good, I tell you, Big Liam returned within minutes. He strode directly to Sean, stopping just a pace away from him. Look, Seanine. In his raised hand was a crumpled bundle of greasy banknotes. Here is your money. Take it, and then see what will happen to you. Take it. He thrust the money into Sean's hand. Count it. Make sure you have it all, and then I will kick you out of this haggard, and look, he thrust forward a hairy fist, if I ever see your face again, I will drive that through it. Count it, you spawn. Sean didn't bother counting. Instead, he crumpled the notes into a ball in his strong fingers. Then he turned on his heel and walked, surprisingly slowly, to the face of the engine. With a gesture, he signaled Matt Tobin, but it was Ellen who responded quickly. Though the hot bar scorched her hand, she jerked open the door of the firebox, and the leaping peat flames whispered out at her. And then, with one smooth motion, Sean Kelvin flung the crumpled ball of notes into the heart of the flame. A faint whisper lifted, and a single scrap of burned paper floated out of the funnel top. That was all the attention the fire gave to its task. But outside, there was plenty of commotion. Big Liam O'Grady let out a mighty shout, or rather, an anguished scream, My money! My good money! He took two furious strides forward, his massive arms raised to crush and kill. But his hands never touched the smaller man, you dumb ox. Sean Kelvin said through his teeth. He shifted his strong, hunched shoulder slightly, and no one there could follow the incredible power behind his hooked right arm. The smack of bone on bone was sharp as a whip crack, and Big Liam came to a sudden stop staggered back on his heels, swayed for a moment, and then retreated three paces. Now and forever. Man of the Kelvins, roared Matt Tobin, but Big Liam was made of iron. That blow should have knocked him flat on his back, similar blows had sent men to the ground for the full count. But Big Liam only shook his head, grunted like a boar, and charged at the little man. And the little man, instead of retreating, charged back at him, brimming with power. The men of the O'Grady's witnessed a display they couldn't fully comprehend. Thousands of people paid up to ten dollars each to watch the great Tiger Kelvin in action, admiring his footwork, timing, and hitting prowess. But never was his performance more devastating than it was now. He became a thunderbolt on two feet, and Big Liam was an insatiable glutton. Big Liam never landed a punch on Sean with his clenched fist. 
he simply didn't know how. Sean, despite being 40 pounds lighter, drove him across the yard with sheer hitting power. For the first time, the men saw a 200-pound man knocked off his feet by a body blow. They witnessed the deadly restraint and explosive skill of Sean Kelvin. He aimed to demolish his enemy in the shortest time possible, and it took him only five minutes to achieve it. He knocked the big man down five, six, eight times, and each time, Big Liam staggered back, raving and trying desperately to retaliate, eventually, Big Liam stood swaying and clawing helplessly, and Sean finished him off with his devastating double hit, left below the breastbone and right under the jaw. Big Liam lifted on his toes and fell flat on his back. He didn't even put up a fight as he lay there, Sean didn't spare a glance at the fallen giant. He turned to face the O'Grady men, his voice like iron challenging them, I am Sean Kelvin, of Nakanor Hill. Is there an O'Grady amongst you who thinks himself a better man? Come then. His face was like a deeply carved stone, his powerful chest lifted, and the air whistled through his nostrils. His fierce, flashing eyes dared them. No man dared to step forward, his stony expression quivered, and with all the dramatic force of a Celt, he implored, Mother of my son, will you come home with me? She responded with equal intensity, her voice and eyes full of emotion, is that how you ask me, Sean Kelvin? Finally, his stone-cold demeanor softened. As my wife only, Ellen Kelvin, very well, my heart's treasure. She grasped his arm with both hands. Let us go home, in the name of God, he finished for her. And together, they left that place, Ellen proud as the morning. But as a woman, she couldn't resist having the last word. Mother of God, she exclaimed. The trouble I had to make a man of him, God Almighty did that for him before you were born, Matt Tobin said softly.